Welcome to the Deeper Dating Q&A, where I'm going to answer your most pressing personal questions about love, sex, and intimacy in such a way that you can apply these insights to the particulars of your own love life. So you're going to leave this episode with new possibilities and hopefully some important revelations about your own relationships. So stay tuned to the Deeper Dating Podcast. If you've ever been disillusioned, disappointed, or discouraged in your search for love, and you know there has to be a better way to find the healthy, soul-filling love you've always longed for, then you've discovered the podcast for you. I know, as Ken's work personally has led me to find the love of my life. So here's your host of Deeper Dating, Ken Page. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Deeper Dating Podcast. I'm Ken Page, and I'm a psychotherapist. I'm the author of the book Deeper Dating and the co-founder of DeeperDating.com, a new online experience where people can meet in ways that are inspiring, respectful, and fun. So today, I'm going to be answering your questions about your relationship issues. And this week, and every week when I have an episode, I'm going to share the greatest tools that I know to help you find love and keep it flourishing and heal your life in the process. Because the true skills of dating are the deep skills of intimacy, and those are the greatest building blocks of all for a happy, rich, and meaningful life. And if you want to learn more about the Deeper Dating Path to Real Intimacy, just go to deeperdatingpodcast.com. You'll find transcripts of every episode, and if you sign up for my mailing list, you'll get lots of free resources and learn a lot more about how to use these ideas to transform your own intimacy journey. I also want to say that everything I share in this podcast is educational in nature. It's not medical or psychiatric advice or treatment. And if you're experiencing any serious psychological symptoms, please seek professional help. And finally, if you like what you're learning here, it would be an amazing thank you if you subscribed and left me a review. So thank you so much for that. And let's dive in. Well, I'm going to need to do... I think a few of these Q&As closer together, especially now that I'm doing an episode every two weeks for the time being, because there are so many amazing questions that I got that I want to be able to answer, and I'm only able to answer some of them at a time. Today, I'm going to talk about four questions that I got that all have a really similar theme. And that theme is meeting someone who really feels like an attraction of inspiration, which is someone who you're attracted to, not because of their unavailability, not because of their mixed messages, not because of the chaos and the craziness, but because of their goodness, their decency, their authenticity, and their availability, and a feeling of a mutual bond that just has a quality of goodness and solidity and trustability, which is a huge, huge issue. So all of these stories, all of these questions come from people who have found relationships like that and are now struggling with certain issues that have come up. One person said to me that she really appreciates my work, which I really appreciate hearing, and that after reading my book and and doing this work, she met her husband, who is a truly, truly wonderful guy. All of the qualities of inspiration that I mentioned and that I write about, she felt like were really, really there and still feels like those qualities were really there. But she needed time and space and he pushed it too fast. And that left her not feeling safe. He was very uncomfortable and didn't feel safe with the unknowing space. And so he really pushed things fast and she went along with that feeling kind of horrible, even though he was such a great guy. So she said the engagement was horrible for that reason. She felt anxious. She felt pushed. She felt unsafe. But they got married. And although he was a wonderful person and they had a relationship that was good in so many ways, in this essential way it wasn't, she never felt safe. And she never was able to get over the fact that she felt pushed into getting married too soon. They did couples therapy 
And it was just at, at a certain point, then he gave up and he said, I can never be who you want me to be. So he gave up and they separated and they have been kind since that separation. They have been decent, but she is left feeling deeply regretful. And wondering, she asked, was I too much of a perfectionist? My soul didn't feel safe. But how do I move past the regret and the confusion that I feel now that I've lost him and the relationship is over? And I lost him because he felt like I never really was able to fully love him or accept him or embrace the relationship. So this is so poignant, so poignant. And I want to say first something that I say to people a lot, I want to congratulate you and acknowledge your shift that you chose someone with such qualities of inspiration. It's a huge deal. It is a shift. It means everything, even if this relationship didn't work. That said, if you're feeling such deep regret and confusion, and I want to say this to Anybody who has lost or ended a relationship that felt like an attraction of inspiration, you know, where there was a deep sense of safety and an awareness of that person's goodness and there was potential and there was attraction where you left or it didn't end up working out or you couldn't really embrace it and you're feeling deep regret and confusion, you might want to explore what was going on there and you might want to explore the possibility of trying again. I think that if we're not sure, it's worth it. We tell ourselves we need to move past a relationship, but some people are very good at knowing when they need to move past a relationship, and they still feel, in a particular case, this regret, this confusion. So what I would say is, there was a wound spot hit by the two of you, where he could not give you enough space, and where what that created for you was untenable. You gave yourself up in a way by saying yes. And so that resentment when we give ourselves up can be so deep and so profound. But I do think if you want, it would be worth, well, no matter what, it is worth exploring the giving up of your own pacing because your pacing is precious and it's central. Just with sex, with intimacy, we have to honor that pacing, even if it's hard for the other person. So something to look at is where you gave up your boundaries. That's something for you to look at no matter what. And I would say if there's more discussion to be had with him, have it. If there's another chance that seems reasonable and possible, you might want to try for that. And even if it doesn't work, you will be clearer after doing that. If someone is not abusive, it's a good relationship, and you're still not sure, there's no addiction, there's no untreated mental illness, there's goodness, there's decency, and you're not sure, you might want to try again. You might want to explore the possibility of trying again. So I don't know about you, but I know a number of people who have tried again and had it work. And I know a number of people who have tried again and had it not work, but got clearer. In the case of an essentially good relationship, if you feel drawn to go back, you might want to consider doing that. And I actually did a whole podcast episode on this. But I also do think that At the end of a relationship like that, where there was at least a really big amount of inspiration and rightness and trust, it's worth it to think, what did I learn? How might there have been my fear of intimacy that played a role in this? What will I know next time? What will I do differently next time? So that's something you might want to think about even now. Was there an attraction of inspiration that you weren't able to sustain and Just kind of what are your reflections on what you would have done differently? You might want to just take a minute to think about that right now. You could even pause the recording if you like. Okay, so someone else asked, are there people who are just biologically not compatible? And she says, with my boyfriend from the very beginning, I had issues with his breath and smell. And she said, at this point, I hate his smell. 
Is this the wave of distancing, which is, uh, for those of you who don't know, that's when you meet someone and they're really available and really decent and really trustable, and the excitement feels like it's just not there, and you just want to flee. And the reason is often a, f- a deep fear of availability. I've spoken about this and what to do about it a lot in previous podcasts. Anyway, so she said, I am just now completely repulsed by his smell. I don't want to have sex. I'm repulsed by his smell. He's a wonderful person, and I'm afraid to go deeper. So is this a biological incompatibility, and what do I do? So this is a really, really rich question. And of course, I'm just going to start with the simplest, simplest part here. If someone's breath is bad, that probably means that they have gum decay or tooth decay. And that is something that's addressable, that you have every right in the world to ask them to address. It's hard to do, but you really do deserve this. And if they have body odor of any sort, same thing. You have a right to ask that they take care of that. It's really important to do that. So, but that might not be this, although the breath thing does sound like it might be that. But I did a little bit of research into this and found out some very fascinating things. So one piece of this is that we have a sequence of more than 100 immune system genes known as MHC, Major Histocompatibility Complex. And what science has discovered is that we are most attracted to the smell of people who are immunologically dissimilar. In other words, their MHC profile is different than ours. In cases where the MHC profile is very similar, there's going to be less attraction to the person's smell and maybe less attraction to the person as a whole. Interestingly, there's also more chance of immunologically healthier offspring between partners whose MHC complex is dissimilar. So people whose MHC complex is more similar are more likely to have children who are less disease-resistant. Interestingly, too, the only time that that awareness is not there fully for women is when they're on birth control. When they're on birth control pills, supposedly, their ability to kind of get the scent dissatisfaction that they experience with people whose MHC is different than theirs, they don't have that ability if they're on birth control pills. So that's an interesting thing, too. But there are also other factors, like, for example, trauma. When we have trauma memories, when we have trauma experiences, certain kind of smells can can trigger us, or fears can come up and they can manifest themselves in ways like a repulsion towards someone's smell. This concept of the wave, often when we meet someone who really is available and we become afraid, we start feeling repulsed by them. So this is something that is also really worth exploring. This is so multifactorial. Please don't think that we are just so much victims of biology and our MHC complexes, because we have to look, could it be a fear of intimacy? But the last thing that I would say is if you have looked at these issues, if you don't think it's the wave, if you have this person address hygiene issues and you know that it's not necessarily an illness-related issue or a hygiene-related issue or a gum disease-related issue, and you just cannot get past their smell, and this goes on, you really do need to not torture yourself and just accept that that's the way things are. But I also want to say something else, too, that there may be like ways that you can be with the person that are very sexy and very hot that somehow bypass some of the smell issues. There might be parts of their body that you just don't like to smell and other parts that you don't feel that way. So if this is a really special relationship, once again, I say look into all those possibilities. But ultimately, you can't be with someone who you just really feel repulsed by their smell, and it's none of the other factors that we mentioned. Okay, so someone else said that she's done a lot of recovery work around emotional sobriety. She had parents who were abused and addicted, and she said she's really proud of the work that she's done 
because she now has really, she's lost her taste for attractions of deprivation, which I celebrate hearing. And she doesn't have any attractions of deprivation anymore. That just doesn't happen for her in her romantic life. But she said she's two months in with a kind and wonderful guy. And she feels now it's the next step. It's not being with someone who is an attraction of deprivation and going through that all of the roller coaster of that. This is something different. She's with a really kind and wonderful guy, and she feels like she doesn't have it in her to believe that she is loved. And she said, and that excitement of chaos also isn't there. So I want to say something about this, and I'm wondering if any of you relate to this? Have you ever been in a situation where you've been with someone who really loved you and was available and was present, and you couldn't really take it in? You couldn't really believe it? Well, I want to say a few things about that. The biggest thing that I want to say is, on some level, that's okay. That is human for those of us, and I include myself in this, who have had particular kind of trauma in life, there's some way that some parts of us believe in the love, and other parts just can't. It's like putting two positive ends of a magnet together, and they just, they just can't connect. So I know that I have parts of me, to this day, 13 years into the relationship with my husband, where I cannot believe in his love for me, even though it's there and it's present. So I create bypasses, which, and those bypasses are all the ways that my body knows I'm loved, that I know that my nervous system knows that I'm safe and I'm treasured because of his behaviors, because of all the ways that my nervous system senses what my mind can't always believe. And I trust those pathways and I follow them. Also, I talk about it. When I hit these junctures where it's hard for me to believe in his love for me, I talk about it. In fact, I'll share that the night before we got married, I took a walk with him to the beach and I said, I love you, I know you love me, but some part of me doesn't believe it. Doesn't believe it. And we're getting married tomorrow. And some part of me is still too afraid to believe it. So it was great that I said that and he made space for it. And I just want to make space for the parts of all of us where we don't believe yet that we're loved, that we're, where we can't take it in, so that we can create pockets where at those times we don't ride on our cognition. We ride more maybe on our nervous system, where we essentially feel safe. Or maybe we just take our partner's hand and be quiet together. A therapist said to me something so wise once, and I love it, and it's been so useful to me as a therapist. She said, the best antidote to an old hypnosis is a current relationship with reality. So if your old hypnosis is in the truth of not being loved, the truth of non-availability, the truth of abuse... By being with your partner in ways that don't feel suffocating, that don't push you and don't pressure you, but let your nervous system and your heart, or maybe your skin, because touch helps so much, register and realize the care that is there for you. That helps us get past those cognitive places where we just can't get it or believe it, or those nervous system places where we can't believe it, or those deep trauma places where we can't believe it. We do not have to get rid of those. But what is good to do is to be able to hold them with cupped hands, with non-judgment, and to learn from them the language of how we get past them, how we hold them, how we stay connected, even when parts of us just don't feel connected. And that's just so much of the story of real intimacy that we don't get taught. This listener also shared uh, some feedback on a previous episode, the episode of the interview I did with Mike Moran, where date rape was mentioned. 
And she said that that was kind of really upsetting for her to hear the words date rape, because date rape kind of minimizes the fact that rape is rape. And the fact that it happened on a date doesn't at all change the reality of rape. And so that that phrase, date rape, is a very minimizing and disrespectful term. So I want to thank you so much for that. And I really appreciate that. And uh, it makes perfect sense. And I learned something. So thanks for your bravery and sh- in sharing that. And I wanted to share it with my listeners community and apologize for that and acknowledge that. Okay, so the last question that I'm going to take, and there are so many more, and I will get to them as, you know, as well as I can in the time that I have. Um, this is a very, very poignant one. It's someone who is talking about facing the end of a relationship. After about three years of being mostly single, she said in her words, I met someone who was not that almost man, almost loving, almost available, almost kind, almost respectful. He was not an almost man. And in fact, they had visualized each other and they shared with each other things that they wrote in their visualization process of qualities they'd want their partner to have that articulated the other person. So these are two people who are deeply, deeply intuitive and each had visualized the other. So she said that it has been beautiful and um, I celebrate that. That is really wonderful. She said one month in, After a day of actually really planning their future together, her partner, who's deeply intuitive, said he needed to take a pause. And he needed to pause, and it's been about a month now, because he somehow felt that there was something that was not right. And so he wanted time, he wanted to honor that he was certain that it was not fear. Uh, kind of unconscious fear. So he wanted to take the time in that month to honor himself and to explore what it was that didn't feel right to his intuition. And so what she said is she said, for me, I'm very intuitive too. And my intuition is saying, yes, 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 this is good and this is right. So one thing I want to say about intuition, and this is something I've also talked about in a previous podcast, is Sometimes it's hard to know what is intuition and what is fear. What is intuition and what is kind of a need that doesn't want to face reality. And those things that we think are intuition can be blindingly powerful. But when it's an arena where a lot is at stake, we can't always trust our intuition. And I feel that very, very strongly. And I think that that is really true in early relationships. So to the person who asked the question, it might be that your intuition is based on a kind of sensing something wrong too that frightens you that you don't want to face. It may be that his intuition is exactly that. All I'm saying is that this is a point that it's good to check in with the friends who know us and love us and hear what they have to say. Because they may say, oh, there, you know, this guy's friends might say to him, you have done this before and don't mess this one up. Or maybe your friends might say to you something similar. Or maybe your friends will say, no, I get it. This really, really feels right between the two of you. But all I'm saying is when it comes to big decisions where there's a heavy charge, and especially situations where there's been trauma or struggling or suffering around something that matters as much as a relationship, get help. Don't trust that your intuition is your intuition. You might ultimately trust it, but get those side view mirrors going where you can get focus from other people because you do, we do do have blind spots. And often those blind spots feel so much like intuition. So I am hoping that this guy is not taking a complete break from the relationship for a month. If he is, I think that's a warning sign because the best antidote antidote to an old hypnosis is through a current relationship with reality. And 
his being with you is how he's going to come to understand which pieces of this might be things that don't feel safe that might be just historical for him, which are pieces that feel true. And if they are true, you know, I just, I just want to say that as we progress in a relationship, we reach a point where there are deep flaws or offnesses that we feel in our relationship. And that is supposed to happen. That is what's supposed to happen. That is when deeper love begins. By the way you handle the things that your intuition says are off. That's the meat and the potatoes of the heart of intimacy. Not fleeing, and going into a cave and thinking you're going to work it out yourself, but working it out with support, with side view mirrors, and in relationship with the other person. Because, you know, what I would want to say to this guy is, yes, your intuition probably is telling you something is off. Explore that, but don't just explore it in your head. Explore it in the relationship. So that's what I would say to the two of you, and I hope that that is something that can happen. I also want to say that I love these questions because these questions reflect people who have lost their taste for unhealthy relationships and are now dealing with the kind of challenges that come up in relationships that are basically good, even if those relationships don't work. So I just want to really acknowledge that progress. And I want to ask each one of you to think about what touched you in this episode? What related to your experience? And just think about kind of, are there any pieces of wisdom in this, any insights that you feel you really want to take and apply to your life that just feel true to you? So just take a minute and think about that. And I want to thank you all. And I look forward to seeing you in the next episode of the Deeper Dating Podcast. For those folks who are single, go to deeperdating.com. It is a new place that we have created for thoughtful, caring, single people to meet. And I look forward to speaking with you again soon. Blessings on your intimacy journey. And that's it for today's episode of Deeper Dating. Be sure to go to deeperdatingpodcast.com as Ken has a few more gifts for you. Then join us on the next episode.